Good evening and welcome to Left, Right and Centre. This is a special 60-minute edition right here on NDTV. I'm Sanket Upadhyay. Three stories that we are tracking right here. Story number one, there is Taliban, there is the fear of terror and there is the Taliban in Afghanistan. What should our strategy be? As of this moment, India is playing a wait and watch game. How long should we wait? And how long should we be watching? And should we be dealing with Taliban, a terrorist organization which has taken over in Afghanistan. In fact, they've not even declared it a democracy. According to them, this is the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. The memory of 1999 Kandahar hijack is still fresh in public memory in this country. The executions done by the Taliban, fresh in public memory. Should India engage? and what should be the terms of engagement. That discussion is going to come up in just a short time. Story number two, years of torture, according to Mr. Tharoor, have come to an end. We are talking about the Sunanda Pushkar abetment to suicide case, where he, all charges have been discharged. He's been discharged of these charges. But the point is, that a sustained campaign was done in the media against him and not just him, against Riya Chakravarti, against others also. So is it time now for action against these media trials? Reputation ruining media trials. That discussion in just a little while. And story number three, one more person has jumped ship. Sushmita Dev, we have her on the show and we ask her questions about the past and what are the plans that she has for the future. But first, before we move any further, let's show you those pictures which are still fresh in public memory. Remembering the IC814 plane hijack, how India fell victim to the worst form of Talibani terror. And then ask ourselves this question, should we be engaging with the Taliban? A 22-year-old memory that refuses to leave the Indian psyche. A week-long trauma in December 1999 that ended with the Indian government handing over three terrorists to the Taliban in exchange for about 170 hostages on Indian Airlines IC-814. The flight was hijacked on its way from Kathmandu to Delhi, refueled at Amritsar with stops at Lahore and Dubai, ultimately parking at Kandahar, carrying passengers who would live in abject terror for a whole week. That was India's first direct brush with the Taliban. And today, they are back. But given India's scars, can we trust them this time? With the Taliban fighters taking control without any bloodshed, India will have to consider recognizing the Taliban government, a decision particularly difficult for India, which helped the Afghan government build democratic and constitutional processes and invested over $2 billion on infrastructure there. So what does India have to keep in mind while keeping a channel open with the Taliban? The Taliban continues to harbour Al-Qaeda. Will militant groups like Jaish e Mohammed and Lashkar e Toiba be galvanised into attacks against India? Will Kashmir become the next rallying point for the Mujahideen, keeping a safe distance from any anti-Taliban groupings? What happens if the previous regime manages to reverse the Taliban takeover? The former vice president has claimed a resistance movement. Where will India be if Afghanistan becomes the next flashpoint between China, Russia and the US? So no clear side for India to take. It must tentatively trust the Taliban. Yet, keep an eye on the dangers and consequences of such a path. NNDTV Bureau Report. 
All right, joining us right now are uh, our guests. Vishnu Prakash is a former diplomat. Thank you very much, Ambassador Prakash, for joining us. Ashraf Hedri is an Afghanistan ambassador in Sri Lanka. Uh, Michael Rubin, senior fellow, American Enterprise, and uh, Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakvi, former ambassador and executive director of CISS Center for International Strategic Studies. Thank you very much. This is an important question which I'm sure any, everyone in the Indian establishment is asking of themselves. And many Indians are also concerned and asking as to what our terms of engagement should be with the Taliban when there is a Talibani government. Right now, they're in the process of forming uh, a government. Ambassador Vishnu Prakash, let me begin with you first. This is a dilemma, and this is a question, a difficult question, which uh, the government is also asking of itself, and people soon will also ask, whether we should engage with the Taliban or not, given their history and given how we have suffered at the hands of Taliban. Good evening, Sanket. Good to be on the program with you. And by the way, lovely jacket. Uh, India has, is facing a dilemma, of course. Taliban has a has a track record which is uh, very, which cannot, which which is uh, regressive, which is medieval. They stand for a kind of a regimen which the the free world cannot accept. And also, the areas that have come under their control, including Kabul, I am told, they are going door to door trying to identify people right. who, were, who were with the, uh, the government or supportive of the right. government. And Kandhar, I am I'm I'm told that bodies are lying of people who have been shot dead. They have been, uh, in some places, they have been molesting women. So the indications are not positive at all. That said, they have been in wilderness for 20 years. Mullah Baradar was in the Pakistani jail for eight years. There have been instances of yesterday's terrorists turning a new leaf. I, I for one, do not trust the Taliban. I do not think that they will change. But I would not rule in or rule out anything. Just in case, in an outside chance, the Taliban has learned that 20 years in wilderness has taught them some lessons. And they are willing to be moderate, to moderate their positions. They are willing to provide a half decent regimen, regime. There is no harm in talking. By, by the way, talking doesn't mean we trust them, we recognize them, we, we give them legitimacy or we embrace them. We, we do not agree with them. We are as similar as chalk and cheese. But if they can show that there is a bit of a change, then in our national interest and in the national interest of the, or the interest of the people of Afghanistan, uh, without agreeing to their ways, there is no harm in talking, and that is what I believe. Okay. Uh, Dr. Rubin, I want to come to you now. See, uh, the, a, a sense in the Indian establishment, we've spoken to a number of uh, uh, people in the establishment, the sense really is that what should our response be? And many people are suggesting a sort of a practical solution and that is based on the fact that we have strategic interests in Afghanistan. Yes, we can't trust the Taliban, but the point is, given our strategic interests there, given the sort of alignment that this new Taliban has, where you've got a China which is uh, seemingly soft, you've got a Pakistan which is a, a potential troublemaker for this country, uh, there is a possibility, as it has happened in the past, that Afghanistani soil could be used uh, to, to have terror activities uh, against India in India. Do you feel that this, this pragmatic suggestion as of this moment, a thought process in the Indian establishment to wait and watch before deciding anything could be a correct thing to do? What's the view in the international community? Well, I'm not Indian, so I can only give my own personal yes. assessment, but I think it's absolutely the correct thing to do. I wouldn't trust the Taliban, the rhetoric of amnesty and moderation is the same rhetoric the Taliban employed when they took Kabul back in 1996. Mm. On top of that, it's important not to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory in some ways. The Taliban have yet to fully consolidate control over the country. There have been protests, public protests against Taliban rule in Jalalabad. The former Vice President Amrullah Saleh has teamed up with Ahmed Massoud and has today launched an attack on Parwan. Um, what we've seen with the Taliban is there are rapid gains throughout the country. 
but when they see the momentum shift against them, they can also be rapid losses. So I would not trust the Taliban. I would not start talking to them or doing anything which could legitimize them. Instead, I would actually look at Amrullah Saleh as the head of the legitimate Afghan government at this point and talk to both sides if diplomats want to talk. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Now, uh, before I come to you, uh, Ashraf Hedri, I want to go to Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakwi. Ambassador Nakwi, the, the problem almost always, and as established and recognized by the international community, is terror emanating from Pakistani soil. And now this proximity that one gets to see, and this nexus now that one is getting to see between China, Pakistan, and this new Taliban. Do you think that this India is valid in, in registering this concern, if it does, on an international platform, that this is, this is a recipe which could be used against the country for terrorist activity? Something that, by the way, has happened in the past. Okay, can I now uh, speak? Yes, Ambassador. Now, you see, the first thing is that the entire edifice that was created by the 2002 Bonn Conference, a whole system of uh, a government, uh, presidential elections, constitution, parliament, everything, that has come crashing down after nearly 20 years and it has, you know, surprised the whole world, but in actual fact, it was totally uh, uh, hollow inside. So it couldn't survive. And now you are facing this uh, problem of you have lost your support base because the, that government, which was totally artificial, which was an artificial construct, was uh, the ally of India and you were giving them all kinds of help and assistance. So. And you say that Pakistan is the source of terror. This is ridiculous. It, I dismiss this allegation because we have to be respectful of each other as sovereign states. And Pakistan has been a victim of terrorism and not a, a sponsor of terrorism or, a, or a, a base of terrorism. So, you know, let's be very clear. I don't want to go into that argument. We I have know, carried out this. I, I know, Ambassador Nakhvi. You know, we are not even putting that to debate. Uh, I'm uh, not even going to argue on that point because I think we've got enough proof and the world is convinced what the reality no, is. No, the world is so not convinced. I'm not going to debate. No, that is not the, the debate. World is not, the world is not convinced. We are considered a responsible state by China and Russia, the two big regional powers in this entire uh, 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 part of uh, the world. So, uh, you know, who, who thinks that uh, we, are, we, we are irresponsible and troublemaker? India does. You are, you are not. India might. United India is not. The United India States not. does. Okay, one, one moment. Not Ambassador not. Vishnu Prakash. The United States does not think Ambassador so. Prakash, I would want I, you to I come in. I'm that. sure you must have handled this situation many times uh, uh, in your role as uh, the representative for uh, the Ministry of External Affairs. But, uh, but here you go. I give you the opportunity again. I mean, see, we are not here to convince Ambassador Nakwi on what the reality is. But... No, and, and neither that, that's not the objective at all. Uh, and nobody can convince him that he wants to be convinced. Uh, it is not, uh, is none other than the Prime Minister of Pakistan, Honorable Imran Khan, who considers Osama bin Laden as a martyr. It is not that, uh, it is not for nothing that all the Talibani leadership was found in Pakistan. It is not for nothing that uh, yesterday or day before yesterday, Honorable Imran Khan says that uh, Afghanistan has broken the shackles of uh, slavery. Correct. The shackles of slavery. Uh, maybe Taliban has broken the shackles of slavery, but those shackles have been have gone on the feet of the, and the hands of the people of Taliban, a uh, pe people of Afghanistan. Pakistan, uh, less said the better. Uh, we, I well, don't want to get into this. Uh, but 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 let me. Ambassador, 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 it's not a slanging match, please. Ambassador, I heard you very patiently, sir. Uh, now, please give me that honor. So, the point really is that Taliban, the world knows, Pakistan perhaps does not know, is the creation of uh, Pakistan. They have found uh, sustenance in Pakistan. Even to now, uh, when the Taliban returned, there were pa uh, uh, Pakistani regulars, the jihadis, 
lashkar e taiba jaish e mohammed who were there with the uh, the taliban and jaish e mohammed and uh, lashkar e taiba are creating mayhem in in parts of afghanistan they are looting they are so that is the fact but uh, and pakistan has been in denial they will remain in denial but again let's not get side track the question really is what to do with this taliban is it the new taliban it is new in the sense that they have learned the art of propaganda they have they have started putting out statements in five languages mm. they have learned to speak in a uh, in a language that you want to hear mm. if i want to hear something they will tell you that but the proof lies in the pudding let's see how uh, it depends on walking the talk yeah. we will wait we will watch and we will take take decisions my my only point interest. over here before i go to mr hebri is ambassador prakash uh, what should be that phase or period where we should wait and watch it is 4 days today is the 18th they came they uh, came to kabul on the 8, on the 15th 72 hours is uh, is just 72 hours Correct. i mean here you are talking of taliban which was in wilderness for 20 years i think we let us not be in a hurry yes we need we need to take an early decision because as sure. i was uh, telling the uh, our colleague from afghanistan is the people of afghanistan that are suffering but let us see Correct. because uh, till we get a clarity about how it's panning out there is no point uh, taking a decision absolutely and and, and you know a very informed view is being taken by the indian establishment as of this moment we're taking our time weighing all the options because we have to that is the right thing to do i want to i want to come to you ambassador hedri ashraf hedri uh you know uh, which government in taliban should now be considered of course the the country has no government right now which is the legitimate government as uh, as was being said by dr ruben that uh, you know and and other panelists also that uh, you've got to engage with all the factions internationally i want to ask you at this moment who represents the people of afghanistan as of this moment like for instance who are you representing mr head well it's uh, constitutionally speaking i agree with uh, dr ruben and the statement that uh, the uh, current uh, caretaker of uh, the afghan government has uh, put out and we are the internationally recognized afghan state and afghan uh, government that's why i'm sitting here and Colombo and our diplomats around the world and the UN Secretary General recently said that we would not accept and as well as bilaterally multilaterally any government unless it is uh, you know confirms with the uh you know aspirations achievements uh and demands of the uh, Afghan uh people mm. so that's why the Taliban themselves have not declared that their emirate as much as, as much as they've been talking about it uh they're also just now returning from different places outside and uh I've been in talks with the uh coordination council formed by former president uh Karzai and uh including uh the chairman of the high council for national reconciliation and the leader of uh, Hizb Islami uh, Ekmatyar so so much is going as we speak uh the Taliban are just out there and we heard just uh, about the protest in Jalalabad and uh, this will uh, continue rising not just in Jalalabad but also just two days ago or i think a group of women had also been protesting uh, defying uh, you know the Taliban uh, in uh, Kabul so uh, the afghan people have uh, lost much uh, over the past uh, 20 years and then certainly over the past 5 years and 3 months um uh probably over a billion dollars worth of uh, infrastructure state institutions have come to a halt uh, having a direct impact on what is a growing humanitarian um crisis uh, which is unfortunately further compounded by climate covid uh, as well as uh, of course the uh conflict itself and so we shouldn't rule out the people of Afghanistan their demands and their aspirations and their feelings and that's why the Taliban this time around understand that they understand that any any arrangement that uh you know should come into play should be inclusive should be representative in a way that is meaningful in a way that is not you know and for how long uh, see there is a there is a reason and a valid reason why the world is greeting this with skepticism for how long 
right now we see a, a, a seemingly moderate uh, face of the Taliban, perhaps uh, you know part of the propaganda, but how long is that going to remain this way? Well, we haven't seen uh, moderation on the ground. Uh, we have seen we just moderation behind, behind the mics and podiums and press conferences and the statements. Uh, if you, uh, you know, talk to people on the ground, especially to women, uh, you know, employees of the government across uh, uh, the country where there is really no access to information. Remember that yeah. our freest free press in the region has suddenly disappeared and that the media in Kabul is very much uh, control. So there is no freedom of expression. Most and importantly, it's no more a democracy. They have yes. declared it the Islamic so, Emirate of Afghanistan. Colossal, colossal losses, much to the credit of uh, President Biden, and uh, very, very sad and very tragic. That's another betrayal of the Afghan Do people. Dr. Rubin, would you like to weigh in here? Do you see the, the, the Afghanistan, people in Afghanistan feel a sense of betrayal in the American establishment? they absolutely should feel a sense of betrayal. What the United States did, and I'm not a diplomat, was absolutely deplorable. We had a political decision to leave, but we decided to kneecap the Afghan government, the elected Afghan government on the way out. The best thing India could do right now is to declare Zalmay Khalilzad, the dishonest special envoy, to be persona non grata. Joe Biden said the Afghans refused to fight. Well, the Afghan army lost more than 60,000 people fighting. The Afghan army was trained to fight. They were prepared to fight. They needed logistical support from Bagram Air Base, which the United States cut off. They needed intelligence support, which the United States cut off. If the, I mean, what the United States had done, there were fewer people killed, fewer Americans killed in Afghanistan over the last five years than Americans who had died in automobile accidents in Baltimore, Maryland. Hmm. What we had done is have a containment and deterrence mission to allow the Afghan government to exist and to fight okay. uh, forces of evil supported by Pakistan, hmm. much in the same way that we support the South Koreans in the demilitarized zone, right. or we had faced for decades troops in Germany. Hmm. What There is no other word than betrayal on this. I can't is... begin to express how furious I, I am the U.S. government. I, I can understand that sense of frustration. I think internationally a lot of people are uh, saying that very, very openly. I've run out of time. Thank you very much, gentlemen. There's a, a coup poll that we carried out right here on NDTV and we asked this question. What do Indians feel? Should India engage with the Taliban? The results of that poll on your screen right now, 19% feel yes, 52% understandably feel no, and 29% follow the Indian government's policy as of this moment of waiting and watching. We're stopping for a short break at this moment. One more discussion coming up on the other side. Welcome back. Congress MP Shashi Tharoor was cleared by a Delhi court today of charges in the case involving the death of his wife, Sunanda Pushkar. Pushkar was found dead in a suite of a luxury hotel in Delhi on the night of the 17th of January 2014. Mr. Tharoor was charged with abetment to suicide and cruelty by the Delhi police. After the pronouncement of the order, Mr. Tharoor said, Most grateful, Your Honor, it's been seven and a half years of absolute torture. I really appreciate it. Unquote. I would like to uh, cut across live now to our guests. And the question that we are asking is that whether this was a case of a media trial, a reputation ruining media trial, and is there time for action in this case? Mr. Kothari, thank you very much. Mr. Swapnil Kothari is a senior lawyer in the Bombay High Court and the Supreme Court. Mr. Kothari, we have had this discussion in the context of Riya Chakravarti. We, we have had this uh, discussion in the context of uh, the Sunanda Pushkar death case also. Now, there is a pronouncement from the court. Do you think that now this matter is settled, that this was definitely a case of some VVIP anchormen sitting in the studio and deciding the fate of people and ruining their reputation? Um, Sanket, uh, what happens is that when you are a top celebrity, whether you're a minister, you're a film star or anything of that sort, you you know, all these things go along with the bad bandwagon. Even if you do a small charity, uh, you know, it will make big news, whereas people like you and me who who may make bigger charities will never come into that limelight. We will never be appreciated for that. So what happens is that when you are embroiled in a case and when your name is embroiled in a case, 
what happens is that today investigative journalism as back as early and i will first talk about the law part the law is 191a freedom of speech and expression and fundamental right to freedom of speech, speech and expression includes freedom of press you as a part of the media media today is a fourth estate the fourth pillar of democracy as we call it inscribed in that right to uh, freedom of speech is the right to know as early as in 1974 the supreme court in state of up versus raj narayan pronounced that as a fundamental right now if you don't have the right to say whatever you want to i will get to the point as how you say it is a different issue what you whether you have a right to say or whether you have a right to investigate what was the watergate scandal two uh, 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 young reporters went about exploring a simple burglary a burglary case which was made out mm. ki bhai this is a very simple burglary case and then that resulted in two years of convoluted investigations resulting in a presidential resignation of richard nixon or what we are trying to say is that if you start off something which may be trumped as a suicide or uh, uh, you know some accidental death of sorts and if you have an investigative journalism or investigative police then that should not be stopped by any manner now as far as uh, how you go about it there are there is a certain words that you may or may not say is a separate issue as you will see in shilpa kundra's case just now very recently justice gautam patel of the bombay high court was balancing the right to privacy and he said pull down only those things that infringe on her right to privacy other than that i am not going to gag the media so what is the meaning of that he is going by the fundamental right of yours and mine to know yours to speak and mine to know now as far as considering your question whether this case is settled now if the prosecution wishes to appeal because a lot many times you see that the lower courts in fact the trial court sometimes equits ye to yahan pe to trial hi nahi hua hai yahan pe to it's just you know a very initial decision that there's not enough evidence and we all know i'm not talking about this case i'm now talking generically that we all know about the politician and the police nexus etc so we in this suppose a trial court would have you know uh, mr tharoor would have undergone a trial and if the trial court acquits no, it no mr kothari my sessions court mr kothari you see i would have right. believed had this been the case of a Uh, of a politician from the ruling dispensation here is a man who is an mp from an opposition party right who was probing this case the delhi police right right who right. runs the delhi police it's the home ministry who right. is the home minister we all know right there is a there is a, there was every possibility of right. there being a fair or unfair trial in this particular case but true for you to assume that mr tharoor may have influenced the police at this moment do you think no. this will be slightly far fetched no i am not saying at all that he is influenced i am simply saying that the police has not adduced sufficient evidence to a court of law on the basis of which the court of law has given its verdict no Now, why why uh, one is that the police did not attach enough evidence my there question wasn't is enough. mr satish manishinde is also with us senior lawyer uh mr swapnil kothari my question is what if there was no sufficient evidence correct that's See, what i said assume, oh, we can assume that they did not produce either true but that could also mean that there was no evidence mr true. satish manishinde okay. i want to come to you now to the main point that we are raising right here and the point is in in the case of uh, riya chakravarty also you and i have had this discussion on a number of occasions mr kothari uh, was also with us how easy it has become to sully reputations of people i mean in this case it went on for 7 7 and a half years a court has made its pronouncement very very clearly discharge mr tharoor of all the charges do you think that this is once again a case where we must relook at how much can you say about an individual i can understand the media must be allowed to report but how much do you say and how do you say so courts uh, time and again have come down heavily upon uh, these uh, electronic media and tv channels and particularly those who come regularly on the tv and i don't know how they find so much time to come on the tv regularly particularly lawyers they come and keep defaming people and uh, without any evidence they keep uh, making false charges and uh, trying to impose their own ideas on the public 
and uh, the electronic media. So Supreme Court has said, particularly those. Mr. Kothari was talking about freedom of speech of the media. Freedom of speech also has its own restrictions, and uh, Mr. Kothari is a very senior lawyer, and I think he knows the law, but I don't know whether he is practicing it. So I, I I only hope that someday some senior lawyers like Mr. Kothari, who regularly come on the TV, and keep making allegations and you know coming to their own conclusions. They they hardly know the facts. They hardly know uh, the investigation. They hardly know the incident, the way it has happened. They try and picturize it as if they were participating in the incident. So this must stop. Apart from all this, the courts have time and again reminded you that, my dear friends, you have your own restrictions imposed under Article 19. Freedom of speech doesn't mean that you go and talk nonsense on the electronic media and please curtail yourselves and particularly when the matter is under investigation. I know that uh, Tharoor's case, for whatever reasons, maybe his own doing because he's such a uh, flashy politician and speaks uh, so many, uh, you know, uh, uh, in so many terms or various, uh, or he has an opinion on everything in the world. So he probably brought this downfall of his own by going so much into the media and you know he used to go there uh, again and again and leading a flashy uh, life mm. so they, people like uh, you know i don't want to name them they can't see that one man is hogging so much of limelight mm. so this will come down heavily on such people and i think supreme court has always said that when a case is under investigation, mm. at least in the charge sheet is filed. Don't try and impose your own ideas. Don't try and Correct. impose your own uh, Sherlock Holmes, uh, you know, investigations that these people conduct. And uh, Mr. Kothari, he came several times on the TV when I was. <laughs> now my point is, if someone in the media wants to be Sherlock Holmes, then he got to be a Sherlock Holmes properly. One thing. Yeah. Today, we got. Having transferred this case to the CBI, it's almost one complete year. We know the fate of the case. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Manish Inde, as well as Mr. Swapnil Kothari. Let's hope this, this brings about some amount of change and order in the manner in which we report. If you want to be Sherlock Holmes, be Sherlock Holmes properly. Don't be a sham of a Sherlock Holmes. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and now let's play out that exclusive interview with the latest exit from the Congress and entry into the Trinamool Congress. I spoke to Sushmita Dev. Hello and welcome to this very special broadcast. Uh, we are interviewing someone who is the latest exit from the Congress and the latest entrant in the Trinamool Congress. I would like to welcome my guest. Sushmita Devji, thank, thank you so you. much uh, for speaking to NDTV. I have to admit and say that this is a peculiar situation uh, as a journalist where in Indian politics we are seeing the friendliest exit <laughs> and the friendliest entry into any political party. We have not seen the Congress party uh, wish someone so well and continue to say the same and you are doing the same. So I'm not going to get into this personal connection that you have with the Congress, the Congress has with you. Uh, this interview is not going to be about personalities. Okay. My first question to you, Sushmita ji, is what were the reasons and circumstances why you felt the need to leave a party which you still so much admire? Let me start by saying that what are the reasons which did not play a role in my leaving? Mm -hmm. Uh, it was not anger against my leaders. It was not anger against any party decision. It was not because of lack of any opportunity because in the last 30 years of my own politics and 40 years of my father's Congress politics, uh, we've got ample opportunities. So I think uh, when I give, when I say this, uh, you know, a journalist like yourself can't understand then why leave at all. And I think it's a very, very uh, fair question. Uh, see, I'll tell you that there are certain circumstances in a political life where a party does many things in the greater interest because the party is 
bigger than an individual. But uh, I thought this through. I uh, worked very hard in the assembly elections. In my valley, we got 9 out of 15 seats. But on an assessment of the situation, my personal situation politically, I felt that I had to find a way not to harm the Congress party and I had to find a way to put up a better fight in my area. I am not talking about the rest of Assam. And the Why only couldn't you have done the same in, uh, by being in the Congress? See, because the circumstances, the situation has turned into such a thing. Can you elaborate on the circumstances? See, I, I, I mean, like I said that I don't question any decision of the party and uh, if you join a party and a party decision is taken, you have to accept it and I accepted it gracefully. But I do feel that when I look at the mood of the people in, you know, my area, my valley, mm. uh, I believe that I am in a better position to protect uh, my ideology, protect the ideology of the Congress and the secular ideology in a much better position maybe with the Trinamul Congress. Mm. That does not mean I am saying that the Indian National Congress is going to die there or die in Assam. Mm. It is none of that. So, there is no conflict of interest here mm. is what I am trying to say. This uh, the decisions of the party impact the party in one way mm. and impact a person in a different mm. way. But that does not mean the party is wrong in taking certain decision so and I do not think my decision is also yeah, if wrong. I, if I understand this correctly, uh, you, your personal decision on how politics should be done and the party's decision were different and since there was no meeting ground, uh, you did not question the decision making of the Congress party yet decided to choose a different path for yourself. No, I may be wrong that my, my assessment uh, of the situation was that Congress is definitely a force to reckon with mm. in the state of Assam. There is absolutely, I mean, I, I can't challenge that. But I personally, personally, the way I felt about it as an individual politician, I feel better placed in uh, Trinamool Congress and uh, don't know, I may be right, I may be wrong, only time will tell. Mm. But I hope that, uh, I hope that uh, in the future, in the future, the larger picture which is emerging in the country of the entire opposition staying united, that will uh, work for the greater cause of actually giving a viable alternative uh, to the BJP. So, Shmita ji, see, you, you mentioned that you would be better placed in the Trinamool Congress. I understand that. My only point is, how was your being in the Congress party limiting your growth prospects? Not at all. I was the All India Mahila Congress president. I mean, I was in many important committees. I have got nominations over and over again. But this is this is my personal view as an individual that I felt I felt that the area where I come from, the area where I come from, uh, you know, I felt I felt that my I will be better positioned in the Trinamool Congress and. I also want to say right now as we speak, Trinamool does not really have a presence there. Mm. So, it is not like I have jumped on to a you know ready made situation. You will have so to build I, yeah, something afresh. I have taken a, I have taken a huge risk, but I have faith, mm. I have faith that uh, uh, this decision is not going to uh, work to either the uh, my detriment or I feel the political scenario that is emerging here is definitely not going to be counterproductive. See, the point is if in Assam you are looking at greater prospects for yourself and for a party which you will now help build, not revive. The Congress would have been a revival story. The Trinamool Congress in Assam will be building something afresh. So, do you think that this is going to uh, be the opposition working at cross purposes in a state like Assam? See, with you the, being the enabler. As recently as four months back or three months back when Assam went to election, West Bengal went to election. Mm. Congress and Trinamool Congress fought against each other. Mm. Is Mamata Di saying mm. that that was counterproductive to me, so now I am not going to talk to Madam Sonia Gandhi ji. No, mm. that was one purpose and this is a larger purpose. Mm. So, is Sonia ji saying that West Bengal Congress went to zero because of Mamata Di, so I am not going to talk to Mamata Di. No. So, you see, to connect the two, because you are going, see, if I tell you I have no reason for leaving, mm. 
that answer somehow is not acceptable to anyone. No, so it will I, also be dishonest. Yeah, so I am saying the reasons are there and I am telling you that personally I felt that I would be better positioned in my area uh, from Trinamool Congress despite the words, fact you, that… In other words, you were not being… Uh, your personal ambitions were perhaps not weighed in or factored in, in the Congress there, there party. There is a, see, I'll tell you something. There's a huge difference between being ambitious. Which is not a bad thing. And aspirational mm. and survival. They are all at different levels. Mm. So, my idea was not to harm the Congress. My idea was not to take an ideological somersault and yet hope that the larger picture stays intact and I also survive in the process. How was your role uh, being limited in the Congress? This is what I want to understand because this is the enigma. Just want to understand, you see, you have aspirations for yourself, which is not a bad thing, as you rightly mentioned. But the point is, why could you have not done this in the Congress party? Was it being limited by certain local factors or decisions taken by leaders who were responsible for the politics of the Congress party in a sense? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like the general secretary. In I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm. I have been in many screening committees where there's an alliance. Mm. Okay, so let's say Samadwaji is now asking for this seat for whatever reason. Mm. Okay, but, they, but the fact is that maybe Congress has a better candidate. Mm. So just before the election, the Congress person goes to the Samadwaji and fights on that ticket. Mm. Mm. Correct, but that is politically... It's a political viable thing. Mm. So, what I'm saying is, you're asking me, why couldn't you do mm. what you want to do now in the Tinamul, which you couldn't do in Congress? Mm. And I hope that example, uh, uh, that example serves the purpose. So, it will remain so, a friendly and, and fight? It, see, it's not about friendly fight. The, the, the good thing, the positive thing about the, the, my situation, if you like, since you're asking me repeatedly for the reason, mm. that... Uh, there is no animosity here and I believe we will not be in an adversarial position mm. uh, after I took this decision and I don't intend to put anyone, Mamadadi or Madam Sonia Gandhi in that position but I had compelling reasons to take this decision because I felt it is not some personal aspiration, mm. I will be better positioned in my area. Sure. Now let's talk about the future. We've Correct. talked enough about the past. The future, uh, Sushmita ji, what are your expectations from the new party? For instance, how will this be different or how is this a challenge for you? And what will that challenge be? See, one thing is crystal clear to me. that Trinam Are you going to build the TMC in a sense? See, Trinamul is a national party and mm. so is the Indian National Congress. Mm. We know that the spread of Indian National Congress is far more than uh, Trinamul Congress and that is by choice. Mamata Didi chose to concentrate uh, in West Bengal. See, it's barely been a little over 48 hours since I joined uh, the new party. So, I haven't really had very prolonged discussions about the roadmap. But I believe, I believe that just like I thought it through, they thought it through and I'm sure that they have a plan. So, once it unfolds, uh, uh, I am sure they will go public with it. But uh, whatever role I get, whatever role I get, whether I am restricted to my previous seat, whether I am asked to, uh, you know, uh, create the organization from the grassroots in Assam or in any other state, I will take on that responsibility and I am ready for it. So, it, uh, you do not just look at your role restricted to your seat or state? It could be anything. Whatever. If Mamatadi says that your role is going to be only in your constituency or is going to be outside your constituency, I am uh, willing to uh, take that on. But just like I took a step for a very big reason, I believe my common sense told, tells me that Mamatadi in these circumstances allowing me to come from the Congress party who she is talking with into the party, she must have a plan. And I also mean, battling allegations of poaching people. I, I did hear that press conference of Derek O'Brien, you sitting by his side and him saying that uh, when someone uh, approaches us, this will not be seen as poaching. Am I to assume that you approached the Trinamool Congress? See, I'll, I'll tell you something. Whether I approach them or someone else 
approached me, maybe not directly Mamatadi or uh, whatever. Uh, I don't think it's relevant now because I I have made a choice and I'll have to live by my choice and I'm quite confident I'll do well and I want to like say that uh, Mamatadi is my leader mm. and will be till the day I'm in politics. Sonia ji was a mother figure to me and she'll continue to be till the rest of my life and many, I don't know how else to put it. Many, many Congress leaders have jumped ship to the Bharatiya Janata Party yeah. and that has been one huge ideological swing. I don't see that uh, in, in your case, but uh, did that thought ever cross your mind like a Himanta Biswa Sarma or other people from the Congress who jumped to the BJP B that you should do too? BJP is untouchable to For me, you. yes. Okay. And let me take you back to what I said. When I talk about my position in my constituency and going to Trinamool to put so that I feel more secure is to fight with who? Mm. BJP. Because in Barak Valley, for where I come, there is no other party. Mm. So, my, my enemy is the same. Mm. I'm, I'm, my enemy is the same. And I believe where Mamutadi and Sonia ji are uh, looking at uh, far more, uh, uh, you know, uh, far more uh, a role nationally mm. to fight the BJP which is destroying the nation together. Mm. I feel my move is going to help that purpose. I am confident of that. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you a personal question. Yeah, sure. Do you think your uh, father would have approved of this switch? My father and Mamata Di go back decades, mm. decades. And uh, I can tell you something, uh, that relationship also was instrumental in taking this decision. And I think provided I am true to my duty, to uh, Mamata Di, just like I was to the Congress until the day I was there, my father would be proud of me. That's what I think. Mm. You know, because I see uh, there is a very close connection that your father had with the Gandhis, you have had with the Gandhis, with the Congress party. I see a lot of old pictures. Yeah. Uh, will, it, will it be hard to for you to, you know, snap these ties from the Congress? Not at all. Mamata Di left Congress. Mm. And look at Mahodadi's relationship with Sonia ji. Mm. So there is a living example I am giving you that there is a way. So the TMC also did business with the BJP by the way. Yeah, I remember during Bajpai's time but yeah. this is not Bajpai's BJP let mm. me tell you. Mm. This is not that BJP anymore. So No, but then like for the Congress the BJP is you know an untouchable. untouchable. But for the Trinamool Congress that has not been the case. Though they are fighting the BJP. But I will tell you something. After the recent results of the West Bengal election, mm. I think the writing is on the wall. Mm. Mamta is out to, Mamta Didi is out to decimate the BJP. Mm. And I think the entire nation knows that. Mm. That, that. That's crystal clear. Doesn't matter what happened in 98. This is not that BJP. And what BJP is doing to this country now has never happened in the post-independence uh, era of India. You and think Mamata Banerjee should be positioned as the prime ministerial face of the opposition? See, th this question keeps coming up. And I think every time we ask that question, we derail ourselves from the main purpose. Mm -hmm. The idea is to put no, our There's got to be some leader, no? In See, the opposition I, I, space, there's, go there's got to be that one leader. Like See, BJP has Mr. Modi's face. Who from the opposition? See, I believe that uh, Mamata Di is concentrating in West Bengal and now maybe in few other states. Let's say Congress is the main party in Madhya Pradesh or Rajasthan. You know what I mean? So it fits in very well. If you're looking for that one face, it will obviously eventually have to emerge. There's no denying that. But if you can come this far and win the election, I don't think crossing that hurdle will be a big problem. That's what I think. But do you think this is going to be the biggest challenge? to get that index of opposition unity going. Because that's where usually always lies the problem. Whenever you try to get all opposition you, fronts together. I mean, fair enough. That concern, that concern is fair. But I think it's an emerging situation. I think it's an emerging situation. And I think with matured, uh, seasoned politicians like Sharad Pawarji, Mamta Ji, Madam Sonia Gandhi Ji, they will find a way out. I'm confident of it. And if I may say so, that when UPA 2 came, you know, there was a cry, there was a big situation, who's going to be the Prime Minister? And Sonia Gandhiji has 
resolved that situation. Mm. So she's faced many big challenges mm. and I think they are all very matured and very seasoned. They will find a way. But for a party which has ruled the country for a very long time, many decades, to be reduced to, you know, 44, 52, do you think that the Congress party is uh, some sort of a political titanic and you have more and more people deserting that ship or leaving that ship? No, I, I don't Many think... Many would say you being the latest example. See, I also feel uh, with all, uh, you know, uh, humility, uh, you all are overestimating me. A huge, big party like Congress with a great legacy. I mean, who's Sushmita Dev in that? <laughs> I'm a drop in the ocean. Look at the gambit of leaders that are still in the Congress. It's a strong party. They may be going through a tough phase, but you cannot write them off, that I can tell you. You know? Very, very interesting. All the best for your new assignment. Thank I don't you. know what that assignment will be. You're not willing to share it with us. <laughs> I don't know it. When I find out, I'm sure my party will announce it. All the best and congratulations. Thank you.